Where does it say? Miami discharge. All right, we'll check your, we'll check your discharge papers. Um, 40, 41. 41? No, no, 42. 1942? And where did you go for your basic training? Uh, Cape Cod, Camp Edwards. And can you describe what that was like? Mm, yeah, well, well uh, we had to take our, uh, all our, uh, uh, what's that, basic marching and all that, and then going out to the Cape and firing the guns, then hiking from from uh, Camp Edwards to, right into Well Street, which is 25 miles, one way, you know, then come back. It was in the winter. It was in a... I was in a 40 millimeter outfit and the aircraft. You recall any of your instructors? No, no, none of them. Forget their names. I got I a story to tell you after we finish this here. That's okay, I know, you'll remember a lot when we're done. Where did you go after you finished your basic training? Well, they sent us into Camp Miles Standish. I uh, know. Yeah, Camp Miles Standish, Taunton, Massachusetts. And how long did you stay there? Uh, a week or a week or a week, week and a half, whatever, till we got into the train. And then they shipped us into, uh, shipped us out and we landed in Staten Island in, right into the ship. <laughs> What ship did you sail on? I don't know. You didn't have a chance to go home in between? They shipped you right overseas? Oh, no, I was home, you know, like on pass, you know, from, you know, you get a weekend pass, you know, a couple of times I came home and go back to Edwards, you know. When they put you on the ship, where did you land? North Africa. So you went right from Staten Island to North Africa? Yeah, yeah. It took us 14 days to get there. What was the trip like? Oh, well, uh, it was in March, so <laughs> one day the ship's up there and <laughs> you don't see nobody. Then <laughs> you get up there, you see everybody. <laughs> I mean, you, you get seasick and everything else. Did you get seasick? Oh, yeah. You know what they used to do? They used to put us in a ship, and then you'd have one light over there, one over there, in the corners, and you were supposed to be on watch for fire. But everything is swaying and rocking and you know what I mean? <laughs> you get, guys that don't get sick, get sick. Wow. So that was a long 14 days. When you landed in North Africa, what did you do? Did they... Well, we came in through the Strait of Gibraltar. The Spitfires were all over top of us for that convoy. And uh, it was dusk when we were coming in. Porpoises were jumping. The first time I ever saw porpoises, they were like big pigs jumping all over the place. I used to stand up in front of the boat <laughs> and just watch them. They couldn't get over how big they were, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, we landed, and we had to get off the ship quickly. and. They took us out, it was getting dark already, and next thing you know, we're in, a, we're in an air raid, German air raid. So we're out in the field, and the Navy's shooting, and we don't, we were just standing out there watching everything like a Christmas tree. Yeah? Wow. So you were in the middle of a field? You weren't even in barracks or bunkers or anything? No, 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 no. How could you? You didn't have nothing. All you had was your rifle and your coat, or your, you know. And when, when you landed in North Africa, what unit were you with at that time? I was the anti-aircraft Yeah, that was the anti-aircraft. Uh, what's that, 40, uh, 406. 406, the yeah. anti-aircraft? Yeah. And what was your job? What were you trained to do as part of that unit? Oh, well, I was a heavy machine gunner, a 50 caliber. See what it was, it had four big, each company had 200 fellows in it. And uh, you had four four big guns that are 90s. I don't know you know what a 90 is, but their shells are like this, all right? They'll shoot five miles. But uh, then they had to have machine guns to protect the guns 
because the big gun couldn't shoot the airplane coming in fast. You had to have machine guns around, so I was a heavy machine gunner. But if for substitute, you'd have to go over to the big gun, you know what I mean? So you but, actually were trained that you knew how to shoot the machine gun and the big 90s? Well, I used to help out now and then, you know what I mean? Just, uh, you know, just to, you learn, just to learn a job, you know what I mean? Wow. If something happens, because what it was was uh, uh, the, uh, all the 90s were controlled by your radar. And when the radar went out, then the fellas, uh, the, the squad on the, on the 90s would have to take over manually. See? Can you tell me about the machine gun that you, sh you were trained on? It's a 50 caliber. It's, it's just a 50 caliber machine gun. Well, what kind was it? Was it a Browning or? Well, I guess I, I don't know. Don't know. Who, I, I imagine probably Colts made it oh. <laughs> or somebody. Or, or. All right, so once you uh, landed in North Africa, how long did you stay there before you shipped out to someplace else? Well, we shipped out to, to uh, uh, I think it was the second day or the third day. We had all our guns in the, in the LSTs. The big guns were in the LSTs. And... Uh, we come under another German raid, <laughs> and this one was a beauty. <laughs> Can you tell me about it? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I uh, the the Navy opened up because all our guns were in the ships. We didn't have nothing, only our rifles, and we're out in the field, you know, near the, you know, embarkation there, and uh, uh, the German planes are coming over and. This, this was the first time I saw a searchlight outfit. And their searchlights, they had searchlights all around that place. And the searchlight would pick up a German plane, and you could see the German plane coming right down the searchlight, they shut it off. <laughs> the other ones would pick them up, you know. And, but it wasn't only one plane. I mean, you know, so we're watching the show, but what, what can we do? We haven't got nothing. So then after the raids was over, you know, it took about an hour or whatever it was, and, you know, they were really shooting there, you know. So that was probably your first time you had actually seen action. Well, I, I, I saw action as soon as we landed over there in, in Oran, but, I mean, the, do you know if a shell is going to drop on your head, or do you know if a bomb is going to drop, uh, shrapnel or what? You don't know anything. No. And I don't even know how far away from the base they took us. Wow. So when you left North Africa, where did you go? Sicily. How did you get there? Oh, by LSTs. And what happened in Sicily? Well, we landed in that, I think it was Shaka, S-C-I-C something, right outside Agrigento. And then we set up all our guns again, you know, all the anti-aircraft guns. And then how long did you stay there? Till the campaign was over in Sicily. Well, I would talk in weeks and months. Well, I don't know how long it lasted. What, it lasted a month, a month and a half, whatever, whatever it lasted. So for that time that you were in Sicily, what would you do every day for your job? Well, we had to be on, we had to be on protection. You know, you, got, you just couldn't walk off and lay down, you know. You had, you had to stay on your guns all the so time. tell me what a typical day would be like for you. Well, you had to pull guard duty and everything else, you know, you know. Then you, you branch off, you know. So how early would you get up in the morning? Well, as far as morning goes, I don't think there was any time for getting up in the morning. Because if you had to go on duty, guard duty, you were up all night, so, you know, different things. Yeah. And when you would man your gun, what, would, how, what did that entail? What would you do? Would you just wait there and with your gun be ready for... Well, that's what you had to do. So you would just... How big a group were you with that would be manning the guns? Well, there's only me and another fella. Oh. On the 50 caliber. So you would stay there at your post and... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You stay at your... What are you, what are you going to do all day? That's your job, right? Staying around or... If the fellow went and got a ration or something, you get to go over a ration while you're there. But there's always had to be somebody. And then everything had to be coded. Uh, 
because uh, you are what they call dead area. You know what I mean? No plane could come in. If you come in through dead area, he was going to be shot at. You see me? Oh, so you, then that had to be a then it had to be a code like blue and yellow or, or you know what I mean? And what would to, the code mean? If you knew the code, that meant it was it was okay. To yeah, come in? yeah. If the first American plane you buy the code, he come in. You know what I mean? But not uh, not so an enemy were, plane. When you were on your anti aircraft guns and on uh, on duty, did you ever have? Uh, Enemy aircraft coming in that you had to shoot at? But they were always out of a stupid range, but they were reconnaissance planes, German reconnaissance planes. Just one day when they opened up, you know, our battalion had, uh, 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 I don't know if headquarters had, there were 16 or 20 90 millimeter guns. You know, and they would shoot five miles. And you didn't have to hit the plane. It would burst, you know what I mean? But the radar was controlling it. But the battalion would have guns scattered probably from here, uh, maybe, I don't know. Say I was here, right here, and probably in Collinsville there'd be another four guns. Uh, Avon probably have another four guns. Simbury probably have another four guns, you know? Uh -huh. So they had the whole area controlled, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so was your job that any aircraft that this and my, you shot at? Yeah, but uh, my my job was to protect the big gun. See what I mean? Uh-huh. Because the big gun, if some plane come in low, he, the big gun couldn't get him. Yeah. Did you shoot down any aircraft? No, not, right that, not that I know of. <laughs> well, they shot at him, but I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, but I don't know. Matter of fact, uh, 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 the radar opened up on, on Warner, and it was, I guess, two Frenchmen chasing a, chasing a German plane. <laughs> None of them got hit. <laughs> wow. Were there any casualties in your unit? Mm, no, no, no. After Sicily, where did you go? Well, we went back to North Africa, <laughs> the Brazil. <laughs> they changed us to Fifth Army. We see, we're Seventh Army. They took our patches away. They changed us to Fifth Army. We were supposed to go to Salerno, Italy. They took the patches away. They turned us around again, and they shipped us back to Brazil, North Africa. Why did they change it to the Fifth Army, do you know? The Fifth Army needed more men? Well, the war in Sicily was over. So they were going into, that's where my brother was in the Fifth Army. You know? So uh, they turned us turned us around, they went back to uh, North, uh, Brazil, North Africa, and then they put us in railroad trains, and the, you know, little, and we laid, we laid on a stupid ammunition for 10 days to get the, back to the Algiers. So you went then from North Africa to Algiers by train? Yeah. I was sleeping on ammo. You know, they had them little trains and it took us, I, I think, a week to get back there. Because, you know, some of the railroad tracks they had to fix, uh, you know, and of course their trains were a lot smaller than ours. And then we stayed there and then uh, we were waiting for, uh, for our uh, shipment to go again. So they, so they sent us, we went by plane from Algiers, Maison Blanc Airport, all the way, in, they flew us into Joshua, Corsica. You know where that is? No, but I'll look it up. <laughs> so they flew you, what kind of plane did you go on? Big, trip, big Air Force? Oh yeah, 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 it took about 300. No, no, 18 guys, <laughs> 18 guys fully loaded. They were DC-3s, <laughs> that's the best we had. Wow. All right, so, they... so our whole company went by plane. The other, yeah, I don't know about the other uh, battalions, uh, but some of the battalions went by ship. 
that landed in, uh, uh, in the Bastia, Corsica. Then they set up all the anti-aircraft guns again because the Germans were flying from southern France across into Salerno, Italy. See what I mean? Yeah. So then they had to break up their flights or whatever they were doing, I, you know. So how long did you set up your guns in Corsica? Uh, about three months. Three months? Yeah. Uh, well, then they got, then they decided they got airport, uh, 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 air superiority, so they don't need the anti-aircrafts no more. So the, all the anti-aircraft in Italy, they took them out, they put them in the infantry. So did you now become an infantry soldier? No, they changed our outfit, our battalion, or battalion, uh, you know, into combat engineers. Oh, so then they, so you weren't anti-aircraft any longer? No, no. You took combat engineering? Yeah. Had you had any training in combat engineering? Yeah, about two months or two and a half months. So now you're a combat engineer. What was your job? Our job was fixing the roads, uh, putting in bridges, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know what I mean? Anything they wanted. Uh, so, I don't want to jump the gun yet, you know what I mean? You know? Yeah. So, uh, as soon as we got through training, then we had to go in, we had to put, uh, well, they had all kind of bridges, you know. You could put, the bridges came in sections, you could pick up one section and put a couple pegs in, already you had a half a road, you know. If a small, if a small ravine where you go across, you put two or three and you would go in, You'd have a bridge in an hour or two hours. But if you had to do a Bailey Bridge like we did, uh, it was under smoke screen for seven days on the Rhine River, uh, it was 200 and something feet long, you know, and it had to carry a tank and a tank retriever back so they could use the other tanks for parts. Yeah. You know? So you helped build that Bailey Bridge on the Rhine River? Oh, yeah. So you said you had to use a smoke screen. Can you tell me what that was like? What was that? Explain what that is? Well, that's just so the enemy doesn't know where the bridge is. You know what I mean? You so know, the whole time you're working on it, they're covering it with smoke so the enemy can't see it? Yeah. The, uh, when we got up there, when we got up there, the, the infantry was laying on the road and we were on our water. We were going out on the water. <laughs> Every now and then you see a yellow burst come out over there, or burst over there or somewhere they're trying to, and the, of course there was an island like that, and the Germans were holding out, out, out on that island, you know. And they would string ropes across the river and put wedges like that, so when the mines came down, they get caught in the thing, they wouldn't hit the bridge, right? Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> There's a lot of stories going on. <laughs> well, feel free to tell me any stories that you can think of. Mm -hmm. The things that happened. Now, Joe, go back to Sicily. When you were stationed in Sicily with the anti-aircraft, what were the living conditions like? Like, uh, where did you sleep? Did you have Brothers. barracks or did you sleep in tents? I didn't sleep in no barracks. I didn't have no barracks. Did you sleep in tents? I come in the first night, I just threw the raincoat down and right on and sleep on the raincoat. Because it was warmer there, you know, but, but you know, a lot of times it rained like heck over there, you know what I mean? So the whole time you were in Sicily, you didn't have any? Most of the time I slept on the trucks, in Africa even, I'd, instead of sleeping on the ground, you know? I'd sleep on a truck bed, you know, with a, they have folded them down like that, you know, when the guy's right in the back. Uh-huh. And you sleep there. You sleep there. What did you do for food? Well, the cooks used to, we had cooks that cooked our food. So did you have three meals a day? Yeah, yeah. So what did you do? Well, if we went out, we had K rations or C rations or whatever it was, you know. What I mean? no. But otherwise, uh, did they have like a mess hall or did they just have a... Well, well, they had a, they had a mess hall. They had, uh, they put up a mess hall in about 
two hours or whatever it is, because they had a couple of trucks that had four by eight sections, and that all they did was put them together, and they had to put a canvas over the top. They had a mess hall. Yeah. When you were overseas, how did you stay in touch with family? You no, know, just the right, you know. And the mail got through pretty regularly? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Used to do a lot of reading. <laughs> Reader's Digest. <laughs> yeah? Did you always have enough ammunition and enough supplies and clothing and that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, we never had no problem there. Yeah, no problem there. All right, so now that you've become, go back to when you became a combat engineer. Um, so you left Corsica and... and we got, no, we got our training in Corsica. Uh-huh. And after that, then you left Corsica? Yeah, then, then we went to southern France. And did you, uh, how, did they send you on trains or trucks? No, we flew by, no. No, 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 no. We, we went by LS, uh, 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 a French ship. A French ship. I think it's, I think from Corsica to southern France was a hundred miles or something like that. You know? And I remember this Arab. I call him Arab. You know? He used to wear big pontoons, you know. And, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the ship is going, and of course, the, of course, these these Arabs, they never been on a ship anyway. But he'd be hollering, uh, uh, <laughs> he had all the guys thrown up. Oh! <laughs> he walk around laughing like hell. <laughs> now, why did you have Arabs with you? Were they fighting well, with your units? Yeah, yeah, they, they, the Arabs said, well, you know, uh, they had to load the ship to get guys over there. It doesn't matter who they were. I mean, certain units, like if there was a, 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 a infantry regiment on there that, that, you know, the ship took a couple thousand guys, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So they, they put you where they, wherever they, you could land, you know? So once you landed in southern France, where did you go? <sighs> did you stay there at all, or did you head right out? No, we, we well, uh, we had to we had to keep moving. We had to, we had to keep moving, and uh, uh, then we had to come back. We had to we had to, we had to do everything because then they were trying to load, unload the ships because the ships were too much in the harbor. There were too many in the harbor. They don't want the Germans to blow it up. So they so then they packed the ships with these trucking outfits, and then we have to get on the truck. To ride with on the truck wherever he's going with this with this shipment, to to uh, they had a big field where they put all stuff out, you know, because what they were doing they were hijacking the trucks, so then we have to sit on the back with a rifle if anybody hijacked they got shot. Wow. You see what I mean? Yeah. Because that's what's happening in in southern France. The French were hijacking the trucks. Okay, so where did you go after that? Well, we just kept kept moving. All. You just kept moving from France towards Germany. Yeah, yeah. Building yeah. roads and bridges as you went. Yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. Sometimes we had to fix the road. You know, like where, where uh, uh, George Patton got killed. We fixed that whole highway from Ulm, Germany, all the way to Munich. Uh, so the trucks could get in. And I'd have, uh, uh, a lot of times I have prisoners working, you know, fixing the roads. You know, so the trucks could go because they'd blow all them bridges out and you couldn't fix all them bridges in no time flat, you know? You know? What was your rank? First class, private. So you would have prisoners, German prisoners? You, and you'd use them as labor, so you'd take them with your unit? Well, you know, you'd, you'd probably be a week or so, and then you'd do some, be going somewhere else, you know, whatever whatever the orders were. Now, when uh, uh, when uh, uh, the invasion of southern France, uh, the invasion of Normandy, uh, 
We had to go and guard the, the prisoner of war camp. Where? I don't know where. Oh. I, don't, I don't know what the name of the town is. All I know is this was, I think it was Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, I can't remember. And uh, there were something like 40,000 prisoners in the camp. They are afraid the German paratroopers were going to drop. And it was cold, too. We had to be out on the field, way out surrounding. And they had guards inside the camp. They had half tracks running around outside the camp. And then they had all us guys all around the camp. I mean, you know, you'd be looking down, say, probably a quarter of a mile or an eighth of a mile down into the... If, uh, if somebody shot, I think they would have shot all the prisoners. <laughs> Yeah. So nothing happened, and all everyone lived through that. Yeah. So they were, so they were sure that, uh, and this was we have to stay up all night. You know what I mean? Yeah. So make sure that uh, you know that none of them escaped, because the the ones that were guarding the prison they couldn't uh, handle everything, because what they had was women in there, and they're sleeping in pup tents, and it's muddier than heck. I don't know how they were sleeping in it. When you had prisoners working on building the bridges and fixing the roads, <clears throat> did you ever have any problems with any of them trying to escape? No, 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 no. But yeah, yeah, I'd give them a cigarette if they wanted it. What the heck? Mm -hmm. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Well, only when I got the ribbons. So it was good conduct mm. and Europeans uh, and uh, sharpshooters and all that stuff. I mean. <clears throat> now, Joe, before off camera, you had told me that your brother John was also in the army during World War II, and there were two occasions where you had a chance to meet up with him. Uh, can you tell me about those two times? Because here you're over in Europe, your brother's over in Europe, and what are the chances of you coming across him? Well, tell me about the first time that you met up with your brother. I met him in Saarburg, Saarburg, uh, Saarburg, I don't know if it's Alsace Lorraine or it's uh, France and uh, on the German border there somewhere, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, how did that happen? How did you even know he was in the neighborhood? Well, uh, like I say, the truckers, it's this engineer outfit, you know, the trucks were going here, and I tell the guys, you know, I, you see that third division patch? I said, let me know, you know? So one day the guy come back and say, hey, I think your office up, up the road here away. So sure enough, it was, I went up. No, I just stayed that just for that half a day or something, that's about it, you know what I mean? Then come back. But, your brother must but have been then, surprised to oh, see yeah. you. But then, the, then when I met him over the other place, then I stayed overnight oh. in that outfit. So when you first, that first meeting with your brother, you only stayed a half a day? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Did you get to meet all his friends and everything? Did you get to spend any time together? Uh, well, I met his buddy, for, he, was, he, he died, uh, he was from out west. He was a good friend of his, they always wrote together and talked, you know, Christmas cards and stuff. Yeah. But he's passed away. So yeah. tell me about the second time you met him. So how much longer, how, how many, was it like months or years later that you, you, you met him another time? No, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that long. I don't know, maybe a couple months, two, three months, whatever that was. And I can't. where were you that time? <sighs> well, I was in Germany. <laughs> he was in Germany too. But... And how did you know he was nearby? Well, the trucker come by. Hey, the third division is up here somewhere. Again, the truckers told you. Yeah. So how did how did you get over there to see him? Well, I went up to the captain. You know, and they said uh, the captain said, uh, "Well, no, this was already the war was over." Okay, so the war had ended, and you were both nearby. So what you went to your captain? Yeah, the the, the, the captain says. Now you guys, uh, we're going to send a truckload or two trucks to Brenner's Garden where Hitler had the thing in the Mal Alps. Now who wants to go can go. So I went up to the captain. I says, hey, uh, 
can I go up and see my brother? He's up the road here, you know, instead of going up to Breda's garden. He said, sure, I'll have a Jeep driver take you up. No, no, I'll have the truck driver drop you off, you know, and then they'll pick you up on the way back. I don't know if they stayed up there a day or a day. Well, I don't, I don't know what, it, I can't remember now, but uh, because where my brother was, I ate and everything else was with them guys, you know what I mean? You know. And you slept overnight. Yeah. Right, yeah. So they got you the next day yeah. on the way home. Well, that must have been pretty exciting. Your brother yeah. must have. Yeah. Well, he he had back. he had uh, what they call that jumping up, uh, uh, like shell shock. What is that? They they call that they they got a name for it now. Post stress. Post stress. So they took him out of it. They took him out of the out of the infantry, and they assigned him to a unit, which. Came out. The guys came out of the hospital, and they came into his unit. He had to get their names and what unit they were from to get them back to their unit. That was his job, after. You know. Uh huh. So I talked to his captain there, and his captain says, uh, "I didn't know about this." You know? so the captain was telling me about everything and how uh, they put him put him in for Congressional Medal of Honor. But he said that Washington wrote back that he didn't do just quite, quite enough. That's the way he put it, quite enough. So they gave the next one, Distinguished Service Cross. There ain't too many guys around here got that. Right. All right, so tell me about um, your combat engineer, what things you saw as you went across Germany. I know you told me that you were close to Dachau at one time? Well, that's where I met my brother. Yeah. That's where I met my brother. Well, but that what was... did you tell me about Dachau? You <coughs> hadn't actually gone into the camp, but what? Well, you can smell it. You can smell burnt flesh. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, when you smell it, you got it. I've seen people over there in Sicily where they, where they were burned, where, this, where this, all these joints here were like butter, and this, all this skin is just hanging like this all over the place. You know what I mean? You can't, you know? I never, never thought when you got burnt it was that way. But, the, the, you know. What did you do for entertainment, Joe? When you weren't building roads or bridges or manning an anti-aircraft gun, what did you guys do for entertainment? Oh, we always had girls come over and talk to us. Oh, no, please. no, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> you might have whispered. You read, you read, you talk, you do this, you do that. Sometimes they, they let you go on pass, you know what I mean, down, downtown, you know what I mean? You did go you on pass. Did you ever get passes to oh, go? Yeah, yeah. Where else did you go? Well, I went to uh, in, in Sicily going on passes into town. Africa going on passes into town. Uh, let's see. Oh, when I was in uh, when I was in uh, Corsica, uh, I was in uh, uh, what they call that uh, uh, when the people get all uh, like riot in a in a in a in a, in a city. What what they call that? Uh, the French Marines came in when. The French Marines came in, and the Italians, the Italians owned the island. And the French Marines, the Italians took it away from the French Marines. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So they always fought over that island. And then they got in a big, you don't know who was who for who, because then a fight broke out. We, of course, the Americans, we just stayed. They let the French and them fight, fight it out themselves. Did you see any USO shows while you were overseas? No. But the girls, the girls, uh, the girls were nice in Africa that I know of. Uh, you know, the wa the wax, they were very nice. You know, they didn't even want to talk to you because you had boots, mud on your boots, 
I want to talk to his officers. <laughs> oh, you lost out on that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do anything special for good luck? No, just say my prayers and that's it. <laughs> what else can you do? Well, you know, some people have a rabbit's foot or a good luck charm or medals or something. Yeah, and my machine gunner drowned right in front of me. Can you tell me about that? What happened? I, 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 it was on the Rhine River. We were putting out a big bridge in. And what happened was, they signed him to a boat. And uh, this was for, them, for the newsreel in the United States. I don't, I don't know, they had three or four boats on that river, on the Rhine River, they were putting that big bridge across. And up above the bridge, we had big ropes stuck, sort of mines would get caught in the thing. Now these guys, these new, uh, movie guys here, uh, they were photographers for the newsreel, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and my, uh, my machine, my assi assistant machine gunner, he was one of the guys that was driving the boat. Well, there were other boats there too. I don't know how many tipped over because they went up, hit the, they went to go up further, they hit the stupid rope and the propeller got it caught and it flipped the boat and they're all in the water and this is in March. So, all of a sudden, I heard this commotion and it sounded to me like the Germans were coming. I run for my rifle and uh, that wasn't it. How I, got, how I got on the other side of that river, I don't know. But anyway, that, that river was just, the, the banks were like this. And they had all rocks, you know, sort of couldn't wash it away. And them rocks were slippery than heck. And I came running over there, and he's, he's got a big stupid overcoat on. He's laying in the water, with no, and he's trying to swim up. He was a good swimmer, too. And he's trying to, he's trying to swim up the water. And he goes up the water, comes back, down he went. I didn't even have a chance, to, I, I, I didn't even have a chance to try to help him or anything. I, try, I hollered to him, turn around, and, and if he turned right around, he'd hit the shore. See, then you could pull them out, or, you know, hung on to them. The captain comes running over and says to me, start a fire. I try to start a fire. You think I could start a fire? No damn way. <laughs> Why did he want you to start a fire? Keep somebody warm. I don't know. The, the, there were other guys in the water, too, you know. Oh. But the, he was from Lewiston, Maine. He, I felt sorry I never went up to see his parents, but then I, you know. Can you remember any humorous stories from your time overseas? Did you guys ever play jokes on each other? Not really, not really. I remember one when I was in La Havre, La Havre uh, France, coming home. We were supposed to come home on a Queen Mary. <laughs> we never did. Come Why? Home. What happened? Huh? Well, there was a second armored division in there. They just put them on. <laughs> they put them on the boat instead of us. So we, I came home on a liberty ship, it only took seven days. But I'm walking down, I'm in a coffee line, nothing, no guns, no nothing, you know, and I'm walking up to the coffee line. I come up, you know, there must be a couple hundred guys in that stupid line. <laughs> and I, look, I looked at this one guy and I took about five steps further and I come back and I says, hey, are you Roy from Collinsville? He says, yeah. I went to high school with him. Oh my God. And you ended up on the same Liberty ship coming home. No, 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 no. He came home uh, with uh, Queen Mary. Oh. So when he got to Boston, when he got to Boston or New York, wherever that Queen Mary docked, I don't know, because we, we docked in East Boston, you know? And uh, he called my mother and father that I was coming. <laughs> Isn't that something? Um. Once you crossed the Rhine, you built the bridges across there. Where did you go? How did you end up the war? Where were you when the war ended? God, I don't know where the heck it was. 
I'd have to look at a map to bring some of those num yeah. numbers back. Do you remember hearing that the war was over? Oh yeah. What was that like? Where you know? What was your reaction? Well, the war was over, so hey, uh, we're laying on we're laying on a stupid lawn. <laughs> we're laying on a lawn. The war is over. And then, how long did you stay there before you actually shipped home? Uh, I came home uh, September 30th or something like that. You know? Joe, what did you think of the officers? Well, the officers are all right. But I didn't think about uh, too many of these. Uh, uh, but the only thing I didn't like was uh, after the war was over, uh, they got you putting pup tents, they got you picking up rocks and making the streets with, with like playing with kids, you know what I mean? <laughs> Instead of training you for something, you know what I mean? No, no, they got this junk. I call it junk. So they're probably just trying to keep you busy. Just like, just like in the old, uh, like in the officer school. As soon as the officer came in and you know, and, and you, and you got some stupid barracks with sand all over the place. The guys are dragging sand in and out. Uh, all they're doing is sweeping, like in, you know, up to Camp Edwards, you know. And then you got this guy that comes in, he's an officer, and he goes up on top of the stupid beam and he puts his glove on. Well, you guys got the dust up here, so you're not going on past. What is that, Army style? That's not Army. That's, that's chicken stuff. Chicken stuff, as far as I was concerned. I don't mind training, but you know what I mean, or, or, or uh, teach you another job or something like that, you know what I mean? But don't, uh, you know. What did you think of your fellow soldiers? I think they were all right. Did you stay in touch with any of your buddies after the war? Uh, no, 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 not really. Well, yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw, I came, I was coming up from Scranton, uh, from, from, I was coming from Ohio, so I stopped at Scranton to see my buddy down there, but uh, he was down a lake somewhere, you know, so I never got to meet him. Oh. I would have met him. That was 10 years ago, though. Wow. So when you came home on the Liberty ship and you landed in Boston, were you immediately discharged from there? No, 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 no. What no, did you no, have no, to do no, then? Turn in uh, all the stuff you had, you know, and then they give you a two weeks pass. Then you had to come back in two weeks. Oh, so you could go home for two weeks? Mm -hmm. So you went home to Burlington for two weeks and yeah, then went back yeah, to yeah, Boston? Yeah. And then what did No, you I went back to Camp Edward. I, what's that other one? Devons. I get discharged. Oh. So did you have to stay at Camp Devons for any length of time or just go there to get the discharge? Just get the discharge, you know, after they take care of all your information. Now, well, well, anyway, when we pulled into uh, Boston, they sent us back to Taunton, Massachusetts. And they put a big steak in front of us. You think the guys could eat it? No goddamn way. <laughs> you had your stomach shrunk like crazy. Oh. <laughs> Wow, that must have been something, though, after... Yeah, it was, but the guys couldn't eat a steak. Wow. So what So what did you do? You couldn't eat the steak. How long did it take you to get back in shape? Huh? Well, I got, well, you know, have a few beers here and there, you know what I mean? Well, you could manage to no. drink. All right, so when you got discharged, what did you do? Oh, I, uh, I was banging around for a while. Back in Connecticut? No, Pennsylvania, Ohio, you know, you know, banging around. Staten Island, had a girlfriend in Staten Island, went down to see her. She was married to a lieutenant, so I said, well, that's it. Married a lieutenant. <laughs> and then when did you come back to Connecticut? Oh, I was in Connecticut, but I went, oh, but you know, you were gone. I was, I, we, we, see, we had a three months before you could go back to your job, you know what I mean? Oh. You could bang around for three months. And then you went back to your job. What was your job? What had you been doing? Before? Well, I was, I worked at Pratt Whitney. So you went back to Pratt and Whitney? Yeah. 
Yeah. And how long did you stay with them? Oh, for, I don't know, 42 years. <laughs> oh, wow. And I know that you got married and have how many children? Two uh, daughters? Yeah, two daughters, yeah. Did you go back to school at all on the GI Bill? No, no, no. Did you join any veterans organizations? No, 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 no. I had too much going on. I, then I built a house here and everything else. Joe, how did your military experience influence your thinking about the war, about military in general? Well, I think the military's all right. I think the military's all right. I'm 100% military, but, you know, if How you got... How did your if, military experience affect your life and influence your life? Well, I think it makes you smarter, but, you know what I mean? But uh, uh, as far as affecting my life, I, uh, it didn't affect me. Talk of you being shipped to Japan. Was there any talk? Oh no, I had enough points to come home. You did. We had. I had. I had enough points to come home. What was there talk about your unit being being deployed to the Pacific? No, my uh, my whole unit come home. Okay. So it's because they had the same amount of time as I did, Jim. Okay. Whole unit came home. Um, when did you leave uh, Corsica? Do you remember what year that was? Yeah, well, uh, it was before they made the invasion of southern France. A week or two after, a week or two. I was I was there at the harbor. You know, I was an airplane spotter. You know, I had to go to school to be an airplane spotter, spot enemy plane if it's an enemy plane or not. You know, but a lot of times in German planes they're out of range and the guns weren't shooting at all. You know, they ain't coming. You know, the guys know what they're doing, but yeah. all they're doing is taking pictures. But anyway, uh, 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 hmm. what was I going to say? What was I saying, anyway? When you were in port in uh, Southern France. Oh, yeah. I'm on guard. You hear me? I'm on the machine gun. I'm over, overlooking the harbor. Yeah. There's ships in there. All of a sudden, look. Of course, at that time, you know, you didn't have these walkie-talkies, you know. You know, like you guys had over in Iraq, you had the GPS that tells you where you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, you had to use a, a compass. You know what I mean? But, uh, and uh, at that time, they had communications. And the commu communication guys had a string of wire. Sure. Big rolls of wire, you know, so one telephone could talk to the other telephone, right? Sure. Right? Well, all of a sudden, I see this. I see this thing here. I'm, I'm, in, I, I'm looking down at the harbor. I'm about a half a mile away looking down at the harbor, you know. And all of a sudden, I see this ship come in, and that stupid ship went up in the air just like this, stood right straight up in the air like that, and come right back down. And they beached it. Here to mine. Here to mine. Here to mine. It's a French ship. Right away you call in on a thing, you know, hey, ship in distress, you know what I mean? So right away, headquarters call somebody, I don't know who they call, you know what I mean? But that is the God's honest truth. I never saw a big ship crawling in here like that come down. Did you hear the explosion or you just saw the ship come out of the water? No, I heard the explosion, but it takes you about a minute later to hear the explosion. Because it's so far away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Joe, when they trained you to be an airplane spotter, what kind of training is that? You have to be able to tell the difference between all the different kinds of airplanes? Yeah, as, as best as you could, you know, because, you know, uh, a Messerschmitt, they might 109, but probably almost like a DC-3, you know what I mean? But you're high up in the air, you too, you know? It's just for, you know, so they don't, if, if you have try to have mistakes, if it comes in closer, they don't try to shoot your own guy down, you know what I mean? Were you given spotter cards? Huh? Were you given spotter cards? 
No, no, we had uh, films. All that was all films. You know? And then they, they would uh, give you out, uh, you know, like a, a paper with different plane, planes on it, which plane it is, and which, you know, and then you check off which is the enemy plane, and you know what I mean? Things. But, you know. but. Joe, do you recall any other stories from your time overseas? Uh, any incidents or things that happened? Well, what I was trying to tell you about about that Corsic, about the French, that was a riot. It was a riot. Oh. You see me? I couldn't get the word. I was trying to figure out what the... It was the French were rioting with the... with the... Uh, with the... you know, Italians. Now it's controlled by France again. Sure, yep. <laughs> well, that must have been pretty scary to see the riots going on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they were they were in the taverns. They were smashing... smashing beer bottles, gonna... You know what I mean? For protection and all that. You know what I mean? They're going to get jabbed in the face with a beer bottle. You know what I mean? Jagged ends. You mean? You cut your cut, cut up. So we clear out. We clear out. Let them fight it out. Yeah? When, uh, when you were in Africa, what, how hot was it? It was about, a, well, it's about 115. Have you ever experienced Well, it was so darn hot that one day with cut. We stopped in convoy trucks. This is this is no lie. And there was a brook coming down, a light brook. There was two kids in that water. They were drinking this stupid water. I got out of that truck. I said, I can't stand it no more. I gotta have something to drink. I went over and took a drink out of the guy says, Hey, you're gonna get sick. I said, if the kids drinking water, they don't get sick, I'm not getting sick either. <laughs> Did you get sick? No. Do you recall any other memorable events? Yeah. Well, tell me about them. We're working on this bridge. We're working on the bridge, you know, and all of a sudden, uh, probably, I don't know, in the afternoon, two, three, four o'clock, whatever it is, all of a sudden, the, the officers were hollering, you know, and we had to come running off the bridge. and. Down just a little way was a railroad track, like that. And it was all loaded down with gasoline, with five gallon cans, and we had to go and separate that train because the snipers put it on fire. I never saw gasoline cans going half a mile up in the air, <laughs> and you don't know where that stupid gasoline can is coming down, hit you on the head. But we had to separate the trains. There was uh, the cars. If this car was burning, let it burn, but don't let that one burn or don't let this one burn, you know what I mean? You know, because they needed the gas. When we finished that bridge, we had gasoline stashed, stashed on both sides of the road with can, gasoline cans. Do you know next morning it was gone? And I mean gasoline cans probably from here to Canton somewhere. What happened to them? Huh? Pat needed them up front. The trucking outfits took them right across. But that bridge we had to put up was had to carry 80 ton, had to carry a tank and a tank retriever, and just shake like this. <laughs> and then we had to had to uh, put barbed wire and everything and explosives all around it. So if the Germans did come across, you just blow it, and, you know. And, so did Patton use that bridge? I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. But he's coming across this way, and seven, fifth time is coming up. Seventh time is coming this way. So they, he needs the gas. So they gonna. Well, what they did at the end, they were having. They were having. Oh, there's another story. Uh, they were having these pipes. They were long pipes, probably from here to your car, aluminum pipes, and. Uh, uh, what they were doing, they, they were from from the from the port of Marseille. They were putting them into the tanks, and they were running a pipeline. I don't know how many miles, hundred miles up through France, instead of having trucks hauling it can by can. They were, they were hauling it for Patton. Did you help build that uh, that pipeline at all? No. Well, indirectly, yes. Indirectly, no. <laughs> 
So all of a sudden, hey, you're going to be on a night shift tonight from 12, from, I don't know, whatever, 6, six to 6, 6 to 6. And the other guy was going to be from, from to, to make the other half, you know what I mean? So the, the, the guy, okay, uh, you're going to be a crane driver. You're going to be the crane driver. You know the crane, you know what I mean? So I go into the crane. <laughs> the guy showed me how to do the crane, you know what I mean? So, I, so I'm doing pretty good. I do one load, you know, and you, you had to take a, a whole stack of, of pipes, you know, that would put like the bales, you know, and then you had to put them in a certain place, you know, because there was a repo depot. They had to have, you had to be, every uh, ammunition, paint, they had to be so many feet apart. So if anything blew, you couldn't get, catch, you know. So they did the same thing with the pipes. So this, they said to me, you're a, uh, you're a crane driver. Well, crane driver. So I get in with the crane driver, you know, the guy just leave because he knew how to run it. So, uh, my, of course, my shift was a nice shift, you know what I mean? From six to six in the morning. <laughs> you get probably a few hours sleep. But anyway, so he shows me how to run it. So then he said, okay, run it, you know. So I did a few loads, so, so that was all right. So he left. I, I did a couple more loads, you know what I mean? And I think I got a little bit cocky. I let the thing go down too fast. The goddamn cables flew all over the goddamn place. I couldn't get them back again. <laughs> so I don't know who the hell ever strained it out. <laughs> So that's what, I let it down too fast, you know what I mean? If I let it down slower, but I said, well, you know, I figured two, three, and I did, I did pretty good, you know what I mean? You know, well, I got the feel of it, you know what I mean? I let it too fast and come down a boom and the cables are flying all over the place. <laughs> I don't know who straightened it out. So did you quit after that or did you keep going? I don't know, I never saw the train no more. <laughs> That's why you indirectly helped build the pipeline. <laughs> what other stories could you recall? Uh, oh, I got a story, but it's not off. This not for this. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can tell me off camera. Huh? Do you, do you remember when uh, you heard when Patton passed away? What was your reaction on that? Well, well, from Ohms, Germany, all the way to Munich, we fixed that road. Sure. So I know where Patton got killed. You know, that was the highway. We, our whole regiment fixed that whole highway all the way to Munich because that's where they were blowing a lot of bridges and and, and the, you know the trucks had to get off the road because of big craters, and that's where uh, I was having the, the prisoners. Uh, Tarring too, you know how they patchwork here? That's what we we're doing, you know what I mean? But we had them little stinky little gadgets, you know what I mean? The tar. You know? I don't know if you've seen them or not, you know. Yes. Did you, uh, did you, was Patton your commanding general or who was your general for your division, for the 63rd Division? I don't know. Don't I don't know. know. I don't know. I never saw a general. Because all the time I was over there. Well, like Patton, you wouldn't see Patton anyway because he was he was hooked with the armor. So he he would be, the guys that would see Patton were the guys with the tanks. You know? Now the guys back wouldn't see him. You know? And that's and not only that, but what is the what is the uh, most wanted thing a general would want? Tell me, what is the most important thing a general would want? The safety of his men, I would hope. Huh? The safety of his men, I would hope. No. What's that? It's that Congressional Medal of Honor or that Distinguished Service Cross. And you ain't going to get it because he's too far behind. They got all kind of medals, but they ain't got that one. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe one or two have, but I don't know. But, but that's the one that was, that's the most important one that they want. I imagine probably Patton got it. I don't know. I think he should deserve it, but. Yeah. <laughs> Is 
there anything else, Joe, that you can recall that I haven't asked you about? <laughs> That's just, the side, he was a truck driver. He says, he says, okay, you guys get in the back. We're going back into town. We had to go back into Shaka, Sicily, the name of the town, Shaka. And that, we were in Agrigento. Of course, of course, you know, you're picked, so you go. So you get in the back of the truck about four or five of those guys, you know. I don't know what we're going for. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, he's driving that truck. Then we're going and going on. Next thing I know, we're going off the stupid road. We went off the stupid road through a field and come back on the highway <laughs> with the guys in the back. And we go down the ways, and there's this guy coming with this stupid donkey. And if he don't, he whack that donkey with that truck. <laughs> so the donkey flew off the bridge. And you were in the truck? Yeah, the guy didn't know how to drive a truck. And he's a sergeant. I didn't know he knew how to drive a truck. And he got us guys in the back. Any any other stories you can recall? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I can. Uh, 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 when we had the anti-aircraft outfit, we were outside of Palermo, Italy, Sicily, and uh, uh, we we're on guard duty. And uh, next thing we see is. This big cloud of smoke is coming like this, you know, it's coming. And it kept coming down toward us. And, and we were aside of a brook, probably from here that garden away. And it was a, there were big walls like that, you know what I mean? Walls, probably eight, ten feet high, whatever they were. And the brook was running down in the middle. And, and this thing is coming down that brook and we can't figure out what it was. Well, in the meantime, the air corps dumped a bunch of gasoline into the brook. And they, they were caught on fire. Well, in the meantime, the, this Italian and, and his son are in that, in that, uh, you know, with the sheep and the goats. Do you know, do you know that? Uh, when, when he saw the fire coming, he picked up the kid and he threw, tried to throw him up over the wall. The kid fell back in, so he jumped back in. They both got burned. That's where I see all this flesh hanging like that. You know what I mean? Oh, this is all yellow, you know. And that's where I see. And Captain says to the guys, "Go shoot all the goats and cats and the sheep." Yeah, but they were all screaming that the, the, the sheep and everything they couldn't move. He shot them all. They're terrible. And then and it's, uh, the fellow in the Italian town, the aqua, water, water, water. They only lived an hour. And, both of them died. They're no help. And the stupid air crash said, "I'll dumping, uh, dumping all the gasoline into the brook." And the brook was running pretty fast. And that, 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 I'm telling you, the flames were high too. But we couldn't figure out what's what's happening because this thing is coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of stuff goes on, you know. Well, Joe, I'd like to thank you for the interview, and I'd like to thank you for your service. Well, well, thank you for coming. <laughs>